So I said that today is an amazing woman. Um, not only was she a former athlete, but the founder of London's premier netball team, but then made the switch from being a surveyor into running her own business and successfully selling it. Have you heard of her before? Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to know more. Okay, Lynn? Bits and bobs, bits and bobs. I know you used to play a little, little, little ball yourself, yeah? Little bit, little bit. No competition, yeah? <laughs> None. <laughs> <laughs> this is the professional. We'll wait and see. So, Natalie, welcome to The Ascenders. How are you? Feeling good. Thank you for having me. Oh, this is an absolute pleasure. So, we touched on the fact that you started and built, grew, sold a netball team. How, how does that work? Because you don't really think of that um, being as a business angle when you're like at school. Netball itself, you don't usually see as a way of, you know, as a career path? Oh, God, yeah. I think I kind of created that path. It's a okay. bit of an unusual journey. No mm. one else has done it. Mm -hmm. um, how so do you're I... the first. I am the first. Look at you, proud, isn't it? I am the first. Why I'm not? the best, obviously. It's I'm true. your chest. <laughs> <laughs> There's <laughs> lots of other um, sports that that franchise model works. It's un... I've never heard of that with netball before. So yeah. explain a little bit about how you got to that stage where you thought you could do it, let alone do it. Yeah, I think for me, one of the big things is about visualisation. So as an athlete, I played netball for England. And that journey really started when I started to visualise myself playing for my country. Didn't quite understand what it looked like because mm. it wasn't shown on TV that often. But I really had that strong vision in myself that I would be doing that at one point. Yep. So I went from school netball, joined a club. I think loads of people joined clubs after school, did that traditional journey, got told, you're not too bad at this, which I was really thrilled about. I really enjoyed the sport. Mm. And then I got pushed along the way to kind of go to county trials. And for me, that's when things start to heat up a little bit. So before you even went to school, you knew you liked netball. Was that because you just watched a netball game on TV or what made you choose netball? It wasn't before I went to school. So at school, I got introduced to it at 11. Okay. So primary school didn't play any netball. I think no. we just literally just played on a couple of things you jumped off of and that was it. Yeah. yeah, yeah went yeah. to school <laughs> apparatus, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So secondary school got introduced to so many different new sports mm -hmm. and I love netball. And being probably the tall black girl that was relatively athletic, I was told I was pretty good. Mm. And I kind of felt that I was too. So I got loads of confidence from that. Mm. And joined a club outside school. Um, and I remember going to club, they're like, oh, you're quite talented. Mm -hmm. Let's see if you can push on. And I didn't really know about that world because it's not something that you see on TV. It's not something you kind of, it's not forced on you, that mm. sporting world, the women's sporting world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So from the club, I went to trials. Mm -hmm. And at trials, I got in. and that journey of becoming an elite athlete really started then. It was so exciting, it was amazing. I learned so many different things about myself. So when you came home to your parents and you were like, netball's for me, and in your head it was like, okay, this is a potential career path, how receptive were they? Because I, I was telling the guys before, I used to play netball, mm -hmm. um, but no, I never... Us a lot. Us a lot, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I was she good at it. I know I was good like... at netball. <laughs> but it was never something like, if I would have gone home to my dad, he'll be like, Netball, what's, what's that foolishness? That's not, gonna That's not gonna pay the bills, mm. it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I don't even see from channels one to five, there's no netball on there. Mm. Why would you, you choose such yeah. a sport? So how are your parents in terms of Caribbean being receptive to netball? Okay, so it was very much an academically led house. So academics was always number one. Yeah. Having a sport is good because it kind of, you learn things through sport that you don't necessarily learn in school. Mm -hmm. You learn resilience, you learn about knockbacks, mm -hmm. and that really readies you for mm -hmm. the, the work market or the business market afterwards. Yeah. So when I said I liked it, like, okay, great. <laughs> okay. Did they still see it as a hobby? Oh, it's well, just yeah, a hobby. It, and it was a hobby at that point. Yeah. It really wasn't much a hobby. And I think, did, wasn't I dreaming about playing netball at the time in Australia where there was a professional league? Probably not. Yeah. But what I did dream about was playing for England, being in the pack stadium. And I don't think as a 15 year old, I really mapped out what that looked like. I yeah. think if you're a young football player. Yeah, why should you? you you'd know, wouldn't you? As a young football player, you know yeah. you go to the academy systems, you get selected, you might play some under 18. It was a clear pathway, is it now? Exactly. But it then if you, if you were so good at netball mm -hmm. and you saw it as, oh, I want to play for England. Yeah. Was there some sort of confidence that was lacking a bit because you still went and became a surveyor. So I know a lot of people, Correct. when they know yeah. mm. I'm really good at sports, they're not trying to think of plan B, but you evidently had a plan B and that became your plan A first because you were a surveyor first, right? True, but not in the way you're thinking of it. So for me, education was always plan A. So okay. me again, a career, have my own business was always going to be the thing that I was going to do. 
when I was growing up, was there an opportunity to make money at netball? Yeah, 20K, 30K, that was not going to be enough. my lifeline. Like, yeah, I knew that, yeah. that was not going to be my career path, and I knew I wanted to have my own thing. Because yeah. the education system didn't... They told you you were a tall black girl who should play sports. Mm -hmm. So where did this drive come to, to run a business, to build up London Poles, to be... And start your own team, yeah, basically, because then, yeah. Let's be clear, there's lots of individuals who leave from sport and go back into the mainstream or don't do anything, mm -hmm. but you didn't take that pathway. Absolutely not. I knew from the very beginning that having my own business, having my own independence was going to be a pathway out the of... uncles and everything around. Uh, family structures, I think, had really strong male and female role models for me, and I think that was really important. I watched my uncle in particular grow a multi-million pound business mm. from literally the bottom up. And I think one of the things that when you're a business person, people always see the glamour and the gloss. Yeah. All they don't see is the grind. Yeah. And I remember him saying to me, don't be embarrassed to do anything. And I think my first business was actually called Let's Play Netball, and I still got that. And I would do absolutely anything. So if I need to sweep the floor, I'm sweeping the floor. Yeah, if I need to speak yeah. to someone on the board, I do yeah. that. I, there's nothing no, that's below me. No job yeah. too small. Did exactly. You your upbringing allowed you that flexibility to talk in different spheres? Absolutely. I think my upbringing and also having a good education helped. So I don't walk into a room and fear anyone. Yeah. I'm really confident about my ability. So, so this, this conversation, maybe you'll have a point on this, Liam. I speak to lots of women business leaders and they talk about this imposter syndrome um, mm. where they don't feel they should be in a room. But you come in gleaming, you're like, listen, kick off the door, I want to own this, I want to... Yeah, so did you have any ch challenges? When you started London Post, mm -hmm. um, what was like your biggest challenge at first or you know any difficulties that you faced absolutely i had five years of knockbacks mm. i had years of people telling me that it wasn't possible wasn't feasible um, why though what were their reasons and um, and um, financial feasibility of it mm. it's a women's game women's sport as you know probably doesn't mm -hmm. really get much funding mm. or coverage um where's the demand for this and i had to go into a lot of rooms the mayor's office i had to go to see investors i had to do a lot of pitching and mm. talking about why I believe there was a niche in this market for this and why it was so important that London represented. And why was it so important? It's, well, ultimately, when you look at sports, sports is like a leveller. Yeah. I think it's a yeah. true leveller of everything. And when I looked at my own pathway as a young athlete coming through to being a CEO, I did that because number one, I was very lucky to have a very supportive family. And two, I've got this inner determination that I think no one in a room can ever beat me on. Like, oh, I, wow. I'm very You're determined and I'm extremely competitive. Yeah. But there were support systems around me as well. Now, that being said, there's no reason why an athlete that maybe doesn't have my determination shouldn't get through. Why can't so they have? you're trying to create something that gives people yeah. that opportunity and that Giving back platform. is so important. And I think for me, you know, when you talk about your life and your achievements, mm. what you probably get measured on, not so much your money in your back, yet yeah, obviously people do count millions, mm -hmm. yeah. but it's also what you've given back to the community. Yeah. And one of the, like, the cornerstones of creating London Pulse was that accessibility. You didn't mm. have to be dropped. I, I went to trials in Kent. My mum jumped on the train with me out in some, I don't even know where it was, in Rochester, somewhere random. And literally, my mum got on a train, at that point, trains were reliable, so mm. you could get on a train, <laughs> you could get there. Often, yeah. And she was absolutely phenomenal, she could do that with me. Mm. But, you know, if you've got a parent that is working hard and can't take their child to a trial, why did that talented child not have that opportunity? Yeah. And London's full of talent. Mm. It's a hot spot mm. of talent. And I felt that it was my responsibility, as someone that has succeeded, to give back and create opportunities for others. But it's so not a charity like, though, is it? You oh, it's not a charity, make, no. Money. So, make money, so how, yeah. how, does it, how did you make money? What, how did, it, how so, did you turn this idea into a cash generating business? Apps, you've always got to make money to make things tick over. But I think when you look not at- Everyone believes that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. And when you look at any club structure, the way that you grow, the way you're really successful is actually investing in the youth because ultimately that's the team that comes through and performs for you. And we were talking earlier actually about this, about how I really aspired by Alex Ferguson and what he did with that group of players coming through Man United. And he really invested in the group and they invested back in him and they got the results. Did you throw, um, any, throw any trainers at anyone? <laughs> well, I, I, I petitioned to get free trainers. <laughs> <laughs> so we did that. We did, look, look, on our first year, we started, and when they said no to me, I said, look, you know what I'm going to do? I'm Who gonna said no to you? England Netball, so the governing yeah. body. He said no. So you, you just to backtrack, because I don't know the mm. there, was no, there was no, there so was did no you process. Go and find your players. So you, let's say, one day you woke up and you said, <laughs> I'm going to start my own team. Yeah. After that, how did you go and get the players? So it wasn't one day, I was commentating on the match, international match at the Copper Box. And I turned around to my co-commentators, um, Caroline, Caroline Barker, I said, 
I'm going to create a team. She goes, OK, go on then. I was like, OK. So I and did. was she saying it in a way like, yeah, right, you're not going to be able to do this? I think she was like, OK, whatever. But <laughs> then I went on and did it. Yeah. I think the, um, in terms of creating a team, what we had to do was to prove there was talent and prove there was demand. Now, I could prove there's demand because it's London and it's a sport, but what I couldn't do was prove there was talent. I could say, well, actually, people that lived in this postcode have gone and played for other teams. So what we did, I said, well, look, can you give me a junior team? And we'll enter the junior competition. So you start from the ground up. Okay. That's what we did. So we entered the junior team in. I got an amazing coach who is an ex-England player, Amanda Newton, a black lady who was... You no, know, I, I went to school with Amanda. Okay. Look at that. Absolutely wow. inspirational. Oh, well, yeah. So okay. she's my she's first phenomenal. coach. Phenomenal. Brilliant. Phenomenal. She should have that role for me. And you, you said she was a black lady. Did that matter to you? Absolutely, it mattered to me. Why? Because we were based in East London and we were based literally all over... Uh, matters of metres away from where she lived. Mm. One of the best players to ever come out of England and she never got to represent her capital city. Mm. Is it a white dominated mm. sport netball? Um, it is a sport dominated by the elite, I would say. You go into private schools, played court by court. In the state school sector, you might get a six week block. And you Is might... that because of what I said, that people think there's no money in it and my, pam my family are poor, my aim is to leave school and make money. Whereas the elite can afford to let's say, chill out for a few years and do something that they love, even if there's no money, because their family's got money. I think you're touching on elements of it. I think in terms of sport in the independent sector, yeah. it's very much part of the culture. Mm. Like you do, we do deals, you do deals on, the, on playing golf. It's, yeah, it's not just about like um, a leisure, it's about you honing in your skills. How do you negotiate? How do you deal with the difficult scenarios? And yeah. I think the sports and education in the independent sector go hand in hand. But that being said, in terms of how the state schools deal with sport, yeah. I think we recognise that football is a driving force in terms of economies of sports in the UK. Yeah. So a young kid playing football, a parent understands if you're good, you're going to play. You'll get somewhere. You'll get and somewhere that's why there. it mattered to you to have this black woman who wasn't respected when she was playing at that level and you wanted her on board. It wasn't actually, I didn't think she was respected. I think acknowledging her talent. Okay. Not only, and I think when we talk about black women and black people in roles, we're very comfortable for a black person to be an athlete, to run up and down. We're not so comfortable for them to be a coach. We're mm. not so comfortable for them to, for them to be board, yeah. board members or yeah. managers. And yeah. I just felt she's over-talented. Yeah. Mm. She lives next door. She's pretty much should be the poster board of what this club stands for. Yeah. And she was the best person. She had so the right skill set. It's that creation of that par pathway of opportunity. So all of a sudden you can say, well, the coach is black. You know, why not the general manager? Why not the, the director or whatever the position might be? She, opening up that opportunity. So, for sure, but I think she was the right... It's not just... I didn't pick her because she was black. I picked her because she was the right person mm. for the job. Yeah. And that's my biggest um, humbug if I'm talking about diversity. If One of the things I dislike is that you create a role because it's... And you think, OK, we, we, we can't deal with diversity, so let's create a diversity role. No, no, no. If you have a chairman that's of colour or you've got a manager that's of colour, it informs how you have conversations around the table. Whereas if it's so specific and niche, one black person is not necessarily going to be the spokesperson for all black people. I think it's about how you... What did, I think during the COVID, one of the MPs said, oh, I've got diversity of mind. And I thought, that's an interesting concept. And I think when we look at that, maybe we should think about that, diversity mm. of mind. Actually, I'm a black woman, I'm a CEO. I'm definitely here because of my experiences. Mm. Doesn't mean I'm going to be pro-black and black's all you're going to hear about. And you don't no, have to be. I don't have to be. You that's don't have to be. That's my point. You don't have to be. And but it's because, really well, important. I don't know. But I think, don't you feel it, you have a responsibility as being, you've already articulated you were the first in a position. Don't you have a responsibility to be excellent at a certain point because others are going to look at you as the first? Sure. Because if you flop, people are going to be like, well, actually, maybe you shouldn't have been. And you... I always remember watching the television and whenever there's a black person, you think, oh, please just don't mess up or please exactly. don't... Exactly, but it reinforces reflect. Natalie's point that, yes, it's great if we see more black faces, black women, black men, but then let's not just pick them because they're black. Let's pick them based on yeah, how they think. Who gets picked they... because they're black? Well, Who's ever been no, picked because well, they're no, black? No, but, but, people, but that was people, Natalie's point, people, saying people it was import no. it's mm. important that she's black, mm. but it's not just about she's black. She was the right woman for the job. Mm. So that and was important so to Natalie, especially if you're so driven and um, you're attaching your name to something. You don't just want to pick someone because they're black. They might be black and shit. You exactly. Know what I mean? mm. White but, and shit. And That's also, I think black women and black male, we have a burden of responsibility that yes. no other race has. Yes. And you know, I toy with it. I understand that I, it is important that in my position I'm a role model and mm. that I have to present certain things. But yeah. 
at the same time, I think, well, hold on one second, no one else has to deal with this. Like, it's, it's really difficult, and you've kind of got to battle internally about how you present what I can do, and, and it then ends up being a little bit one-dimensional in terms of what I can present sometimes, because... For example? For instance, as a black woman walking into a room, I know that potentially people have got preconceptions about what I'm like, you know, and the old adage would be how people talk about Naomi Campbell. Like when you talk about black, and I'm talking about dark skinned black women, mm. we've got this, the hypersexualized, they're aggressive. They're, there's a lot of preconceptions out there mm. that maybe people are not conscious of, but they probably have them. Mm -hmm. And so when I walk in, I'm like, okay, Natalie, be, be your best form of yourself. But if I'm coming at a, if I'm not very nice, well, I'm really good at my job, but I, I still have Why to... Why should you have to face... You have to be so mm. nice when exactly. other people don't have to be so but nice. But that's the reality. You can't get away from that. That's the environment we're no, in. No, but it's about breaking down perception because you have Agreed. maybe white people that have also, considering attitude. that before you even walk in the room, why should you have to even think about that? Yeah, because that's exactly. the real world. But then did you... When you were... You're not, you're not in this utopia where you no, can just sit around and say everyone's not going to... You know when you get up in the morning if you have your hair in a certain way or you wear a certain amount of clothing in a certain way or... or People may judge you, but you still that doesn't stop you getting out of bed. No, does but it? this is the but level of ignorance. The level of ignorance. But though, it, it doesn't. But it does. Like for instance, I'm wearing braids today. So yep. those people are going to think, oh yeah, she's really cultural. I'm going to have my hair straight tomorrow. It doesn't no. mean I'm not cultural. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think when so what I'm saying when I'm in that role, there's so much more that goes behind every movement because I am conscientious. Yeah. I am conscientious that I'm being looked. Yeah. I'm being critiqued. However, what I would like to get to the stage is, is that I walk in a room, you judge me on whatever I present to you, not on preconceived notions, but I'm not, I'm aware it's there. So. If, they're too, if they're too regular, yeah. I understand what Natalie said, if they're too regular in terms of because there's this perception that the majority of dark skinned women have attitude, mm -hmm. that needs to be broken down. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're going to go into life where people are going to have misconceptions all the time, yeah. but not at the rate of that. When yeah. you see a white woman, you're not going to mm. naturally think this way because they're white. Whereas with dark skinned black women, that's yeah. the case. But prior to you starting your own team, when you were a player, yeah. did mm. you have any issues with where you say, like, maybe one of the only black girls on the team and had issues in the dressing room with other white girls? Um, judging you, having that same perception. perception yeah. We were lucky that we came through as a group of black girls. There's a, a oh, few of us, okay. so it's quite nice. We actually probably dominated the culture <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> but, Took um, over, yeah. Exactly <laughs> yeah. that. But there was some language issues. So, um, and these people are lovely people. And I think sometimes a lot of stuff is about education and about yeah. making a, people aware. Ignorance rather than ignorance. Oh, yeah. yeah. I've been called coloured. Like, I was like, oh, no, I'm definitely black. <laughs> and, yeah, and was this like when you were young? Yeah, but it wasn't. So this is the thing, I think when you encounter something that is not appropriate, yep. mm. you are in control about how you respond. Mm. And I really felt that the person that said that actually the didn't, intent wasn't didn't yeah, actually yeah, understand where yeah. the, how that could make me feel. Mm. So I explained it to her, I go, you shouldn't call black people when I'm coloured, it's yeah. quite offensive. Yeah. She goes, oh my God, I didn't realise. And it, But when you start to kind of come beyond the bubble of London, Things are a bit different. Yeah. It's very relevant right now, <laughs> though, isn't it? Obviously, the you know the movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, and mm. you know more open conversations happening with people that are not talking from a place where they're you know discriminatory, but more from a place where they're uneducated. Oh, but yeah. with with that's with race, but then with gender, you have mm. people like you know female football. Mm. They're having to compare themselves all the time to male football, which is obviously seen as such a bigger thing mm. compared to female football. With netball, you've got no. Me male netball, do you? Well, there is male netball, but not to the scale and the level. Really? There is male netball. There is male netball. But it's so I tiny. It's, 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 it's like no one knows. It must be a minor, though, isn't it? It's a minor. It's a minor. Come on. It's a minor. Who made me netball? But essentially, <laughs> essentially, in that field. I mean, they're all seven foot. I should shut them out. Do you know what? It's interesting that you've said that because this is probably one of the only areas where it's the other way round. Where I genuinely didn't know. Men are on the back foot. Whereas women are, you, you're already you're up leading, there yeah. compared to men. As with football, it's the other way around. Oh, so you've not had to deal with any gender issues, have you? Like but as a woman, gender issues, yes, because you get compared to basketball. Oh, you know, it's the it's the, okay. girl, it's the girls' version of basketball. Oh. No, it's not. It's a completely different game. They see it as the weaker, sports. pathetic version the to same basketball. Same way, any female sport. I think we have the same challenges, but in a different way. I think yeah. we're just discredited because it's not known for men playing it. Mm. Whereas women's football, it's, it's critiqued for being slow or mm. not being the same pace. And I remember when Serena and Venus sort of came on the yes. scene with tennis. Yeah. 
And I think someone said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm the 45th, I don't know what rank he was, I'm lying here, but he said in whatever rank he was, I'd beat her. Mm. And there was a big debate about whether or not she would beat this gentleman. Mm. And I felt, and what she did was really interesting. She said, well, actually, I'd probably beat someone up to a certain level, but it's not the same sport. We're yeah. not playing the same game mm. and there's different artistry in it. And I think for what we're trying to do as women's sport is one, get recognition, but two, the acknowledgement that these are athletes that dedicate their lives to yeah. performance and becoming better. Mm. And I think once, we have that, then I think we'll get a bit more respect. But coverage is important. If you don't mm. see it, you don't understand it. Yeah. And I think, so of Mel's perception, I might be wrong, of netball, it's from when they watched it at school, yes. potentially. Um, yeah. And but the from, Olympics changed that, didn't it? Commonwealth Games, correct. That's yeah. huge. The Commonwealth Games, absolutely brilliant to win that gold medal. Mm. And I think, we're like, oh, I think as a nation, we're good at feeling proud when we win something. Mm -hmm. Doesn't happen that often, but when we win, we're behind it. Like, <laughs> we, we, it. Yeah. we, yeah. we take it. that, whatever it is. I told you about that lot. <laughs> I knew they were good. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it's brilliant, and everyone gets behind it. And I think at that moment, you feel like a real surge of national pride. Mm. Yeah. Now, when you take away those showcase events, it's really trying to translate that into like an everyday audience. Yep. And for us, I think that's been the biggest struggle in our world in terms of getting people to understand, well, actually, these girls play elite netball and they yeah. play it week yeah. in, week mm. out, and they're really determined, they're really mm. strong, they're athletic, but it's a lack of understanding. And So you're, 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 you've, you've been at the top, mm -hmm. you've, you've run your own company, you've successfully sold and exited out of it, congratulations. Thank you. Um, I'll have a fiver when you finish. <laughs> but uh, but the, the, the thing for me now is, what, would, what do you want to see change? Or mm. what, what has changed that you want to accelerate and push on? I think as a sport, it's really important that more people get to see it. I think they have a great deal with Sky, and that's amazing, but it limits the amount of content that's out there on a week-to-week -week basis. I think it's, there's an understanding that if you want to be really passionate about something or a sport or a team, you need to see them play every week. Mm. Yeah. If not, you die off. And you know, at the moment, we get one match filmed per round. Not quite the same. Do you think when you look at some of the other sports that are not so glamorous, so mm. for example, for me, like darts or snooker, it's the way that they're marketed. So for, for example, someone like Barry Hearn, that's yeah. you know, been so invested in, in darts and so invested in snooker and, and various other things and boxing, of course. Yeah. The way that that's been pushed forward at the foot, it should, you know, as far as I'm concerned, darts is a pub sport, so I'm probably upsetting and alienating a whole audience sector here. But, you know, it's more about how it's positioned and how it's driven and by whom. Absolutely. Match rooms are actually involved in netball. So they have a one-off oh, okay. competition right. once a year. Yeah. It's been cancelled this year due to COVID, but mm. you usually have a one-off competition every year at, um, at the Copper Box Arena. Mm. Absolutely, it is marketing. Like, what is selling? And I think we need to critique ourselves as a sport mm. and look at what can we do better. And that's a difficult conversation to have. Like even as an individual, when you critique yourself, okay, how can I improve? Mm -hmm. We really need to look at, examine what we could do better. But I don't think netball sits alone. I think it's women's sport in general. Do you it think is, women is. are, un uh, do you think we're unrealistic? Because I know when it comes to the race debate, when it comes to the gender debate, when it comes to all these different debates, they're new schools of thought. Mm. So as soon as, you know, um, the race debate comes up, we have moved on a massive amount since the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, but do people want things instantly? So when it comes to uh, women's sport, do we want too much too soon, knowing that a lot of these areas are new? And you said something interesting earlier that, you know, in terms of female sport, there's a reason why it doesn't have the coverage. Mm. Uh, going back to your original point, have we moved on race? I think the perception of it has moved on, but I don't think it really has, mm. if I'm being honest. You don't think anything's got better with race? I've, I'm not saying it hasn't. I think the acknowledgement of it has got better, but I think there's areas that really do need to be worked on. So th that's a debatable point yeah. for me. But I agree, by the way, yeah. Uh, I disagree. I know you would. <laughs> I, do, yeah. I do disagree. Why, why do you disagree? I disagree because, well, both my parents weren't born here, but mm -hmm. if they came here around the, the Windrush era, yeah. they could not go into a swimming pool in a hotel because they were black. Tell me any places in London that you can't go to a swimming pool being a black person. So we have moved on. But hold on a second. Yeah. Yeah. But there's how... And yeah. that's a very simplistic example, yeah, no, no, obviously. No, 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 it's not. It's, it's a but good to, example. To but, say oh. nothing's progressed, only the perception, 
I think overt racism is definitely gone. It's accepted that it's not acceptable. However, when we talk about racism, racism is about power. It's about mm. power structures and mm. how one group has power over another mm. and how they can limit opportunities and how it can impact it's your more life. It's more of a systemic. It's systemic. Mm. And I think when you talk, systemic for me is more dangerous than overt. If someone says to me, uh, I'm not going to say the words, yeah. but what, X. Yeah. Okay, okay, cool, right. You can deal with that. I can deal with that. If someone's stopping me having the ability of getting a job or getting opportunities, that's affecting my whole lifestyle. Mm. Which I and, have I'm, no I'm glad, and I'm exactly. glad that you said that, but it goes back to my initial question with um, female sport, women's sure. sport, and the race debate. It's about reality. For sure. So yes, systemic racism is there, but this is a system that's built over hundreds of years. Correct. We just got here. So to think that we can stop systematic institutional racism mm -hmm. when we were only visible since the 40s is not realistic. No, but, you're system, still start your somewhere point, but I think your point is you're trying to say that it's moved on considerably enough mm -hmm. and I think what I'm hearing... No, I just said it has changed. I didn't say considerable. I'm not saying it's, no, no, we're making you're, you're, no, leaps no, no, and bounds. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I'm saying there's progression. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm saying there's progression. You were talking about <laughs> swimming pools and all this thing. Right? So you're saying it's moved on. And I think, uh, me personally, I don't know about you, We Joe, haven't progressed. I don't think it's progressed enough. So I'm, I'm very clear that with my children, I will have very different conversations still with my children that my yeah. mother had with me. For sure. That's not progression. In my mind, mm. that's not enough progression. So I don't doubt your okay, point. Okay, enough then. Mm. Yeah, but, but both of the points were it hasn't progressed, only the no, perception no, but, but, has. But your perce the way you placed it, it sounded like we're in a different world, Tim. <laughs> Wake up. What you no, no, no. For? I'm not, again, I, not for a moment have I said leaps and bounds. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I think it, it's dangerous to say. Nothing, Nothing has sure. happened. Yeah, because, I agree with that. And I also think it's uh, unrealistic to say that a group of people that came here in the 40s and the 50s, mm. we're going to be integrated and a system that initially wasn't for us mm. is now going to be for mm. us over a few decades. It's not mm. realistic. So going back to female sport now, um, is there a lack of coverage, a lack of finances, just because it is quite new. When you think of actual female mm. sport, yep. from a monetary point of view, it's a new thing. Because it's not, but it's, yeah. it's not And maybe there is some, maybe there's some, sure. maybe there's some misogyny in that, where, why am I going to watch a group of females with a ball? I'd rather watch men go and play football. But like, what Natalie's saying, it, for example, is her you know, pulse was the first of its kind. Yeah. It didn't exist before. So actually, you're making a new market for that. So. To start off with, there will be some, you know, there will be some opposition to it as such because yeah. it's new. Yeah, absolutely. But now it's becoming more mainstream. You know, hopefully, other franchises pop up. You yeah. Know, Manchester, is there any such accountability? Such? Is what I, I meant yeah. for mm -hmm. women that we can make it better and more visible. I, I, mm. I completely agree with you. I think as women, we need to look at our sport, how we market it, who yeah. we're marketing it to. If it to. Yeah. Um, netball, we get shown on a Monday night at a certain slot. Is that the right slot for our August mm. audience? Who is our audience? Mm. And I think there's a lot of work that's got to be done about how we create a product that is going to be successful, that's going to be attractive. And I mm. think when you look back at rugby and the premiership, they weren't where they were. 25, 30 years mm. ago. They've really done some good work in terms of one, creating a brand, creating... Um, I think they've really worked on their structures, the commercialization of the game. Mm. And I think, yes, we are behind that. Absolutely, we're behind it. Mm. But we've, we've got sports that are ahead of us. Yeah. Because of time. Say, there's opposition from other sports exactly. as well. Yeah. And then, but then, you know, I've looked at the US structure and they've got multiple sports that seem to be very successful and they don't seem to affect one another. So you've got ice hockey, you've is that got the NBA, numbers, though? baseball. It might be the, the numbers. USA is so huge. Yeah. It is, huge. but I think it's with us. I think football is the dominant, like, dominant sport in the UK. You might get rugby sliding in behind, yeah. but we could make room for another sport. I, I don't think there's a reason why we can't. Oh, without a doubt. But is it our do culture? Do, it? do we need to be more open culturally? Well, in terms of sport. I think, what I would say is I don't have all the answers. If I did, I'd probably be in a different position right now. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you won't be talking to us, innit? <laughs> I want it somewhere else. <laughs> but I do think it needs to be examined. And I think we need to look at, one, the world's change. Yeah. So as much as we might talk about it's in an English sport playing in these this count, these counties in this area. Yeah. Well, we've got the internet now, so it doesn't really matter if I'm playing mm. it in mm. Timbuktu. Yeah, yeah, of what, how are we are being an attractive product on a global market? Mm. For me, that's the most interesting question. How do we compete? How would what would we all want to ask questions? Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> if you were, if someone came up to you, sure. 19 years old, mm -hmm. woman, and said, 
I want to start a sports team. It could be netball, it could be um, volleyball, it could be football, anything. Mm -hmm. What would be your main five key pointers from having nothing? She has no money, she's just got so much passion, which you said is your driving force as well. Um, and she wants to do it. What's her best way? Number one, education. Mm. You've got to have education to fall back on. Um, of the sport or of? In general, as a business. I think if you're going to set up a so business, forget the sport. Business you've got to yeah. understand business the structures anything. behind it. Um, I think you have to understand the sport. Mm. I'm, not, I'm assuming the person would understand the sport. Yep. Networking. You, you've got to get out there. You've got to get there. We hear, we hear that word networking yeah. so much, and I want to just get into networking. No, no, but we'll let, let's finish well, our three points. Oh, two okay. points. We've got three. I might forget. 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 Go on, go on. Let me, let me. Let me breathe. Let me breathe. Let me breathe. Let me breathe. Please. So we're talking about networking. Yeah. Then I think you have to go and absolutely go and knock down doors and embarrass people and go, why have you not done this? Why have you not invested in this? No shame. No shame. Like literally just call things out. Publicly or in any form anyway. you've got. Yeah, call people out. And use your forum. Mm. And that's part of your network. And then lastly, I think belief. I think self-belief has probably been the strongest asset that I have mm. as a yeah. character because you can tell me, I can say I'm going to do something. You think, oh my God, what the hell is she talking about? But I'm pretty much going to do it. I know I'm going to mm. do it. Yeah. Using that conversation about go and start your team then. Yeah. yeah. Okay, watch yeah. me. I will. Yeah. Exactly yeah, that. Yeah, and I yeah. think if you've got that self-belief and it's not, like I talked about earlier, it's not glamorous. It's not fun all the time. It can be mm. really gritty. And it can be lonely as well, because sometimes when you've got a vision and you can see something, mm -hmm. just because you can see it doesn't mean everyone else can. Yeah. And that's mm. the beauty of it. Mm. Like if you look at all the massive business concepts that are amazing that, that turn the world around, no one else believed in them to start at off first. with at first. Yeah. So when you're a pioneer, when you're kind of going at it, don't expect everyone to understand your journey Maybe as well. nobody. No, no one might. Mm. But you've you got to believe be in yourself. Enough. You're big enough. Oh, I've got one more thing. Oh. Sorry, I'm going to go over your five. No, the last thing would be is to acknowledge when something doesn't work. I think people, and when entrepreneurs are like, oh, I was so successful like this. Yeah. I've had so many failures, like yes. literally. Yes. But when do you stop? When you've lost enough amount of money, you're like, you're so tired. <laughs> oh, so, so it's monetary. <laughs> right when the money no, it's monetary. It can be time oh. as well. Some people don't know when to stop. No, it's, mo it's yeah. money and time. So you get to a point where you're like, okay, I've tried this. I've worked through different things. Yeah. It's not working. Stop banging it's not it's working. But know why it hasn't worked. Like, this is the lesson. Like, don't be Learn upset about it. it. Yeah. Love me. Mm. And you know what? I've had people, like, laugh at things I've done. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to be laughing. And I have been. Well, I didn't laugh. But I'm like, actually, mm. I've gone through this process. I've understood it now. And now I'm going to come at it at a different angle. Mm. And that's where you come in resilience. Like, you just keep on going. Keep on trying. But if it's not working, mm. accept move it. On. Hands up. Move on. From, for, for the people that would watch this or listen to this conversation and say, you know, what learnings did you, you know, from your failures, what were the key learnings that, that you either wouldn't touch again or absolutely what you need to hold on to? Don't be led by your ego. So my ego would tell me that... I'm finished already then. <laughs> <laughs> been done, man. <laughs> no, you can't be led by your ego. <laughs> no, my ego. You, you get led by the bank. So if you really numbers. think something's really... Exactly, numbers are key. You, you really believe in something, you're, you're working hard, it's not working, it's, and you just keep on pushing... Like, Sometimes you've got to acknowledge and ask Going why. Back to your other point, yeah. mm. know when to stop. Know when to stop, ask why. And also mm. analyse it and analyse yourself. Yeah. And I think critiquing yourself is something that we're not so good at, potentially. Yeah. We're not really, mm. we, we didn't learn that in school to mm. self critique and self analyse. Mm. And do it and do it and have a good group of people around you that mm. you could say, Look, I'm doing this. Do that. What's your thoughts? But an honest, an honest, 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 honest group. Yeah. Because yeah. otherwise, sometimes you get called. In fact, now, you've done so much, um, and we've covered just a small piece of this. What What's next for you? What's What's the things you're up to and now? And why did what's you next? sell London? If it was your baby and you were so passionate, and it was like I don't see a lot of people like me in it. Mm -hmm. um, why did you sell your baby? Yeah, that's a hard. It's, it was a hard decision. I think I got to the stage where, whilst it'd been a professional team for two years, I mean, a junior team for two years before that, mm. I'd been working on that for about four years beforehand. Mm. Yeah. And I think when you invest your life and your soul into something, you're, you become entwined mm. and it's draining. And you've got to acknowledge how you are utilising yourself mm -hmm. and what's going to keep you happy as an individual. And I got to the point where I was like, Natalie, the achievement is you made it. You've created this. You've done this. The legacy is there. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be at the forefront pushing that door anymore. Mm -hmm. And I needed to prioritise myself as an individual. Mm -hmm. And it had been coming for a while. It was a really tough conversation to have with close friends and family. But it was the right thing for me. And I think for me, I'm so invested in everything I do. 
to retain that level of intensity, think about family life, all that stuff. I, you know, I can't have it all. And I think there's this big phrase about, you know, you can do it all, women can do it all. Can we? No. Can we do it all? Yeah, it's a good point. I, I don't think we can. I don't, why, think, why I don't think it's a problem. Because when you're at a CEO level, you have to be somewhat selfish. Yeah. And when things happen, you can't be like, oh, I'm, a, I'm not on call now, so I can't, like, I'm, I'll do this Monday morning. Mm. Yeah. You're, all, you're always available. Is and that you thinking about maybe starting a family, absolutely. husband, family children, life. you don't have any at the moment? No, and I think for me, how could I toss up two babies? One that I created, one I, I'm hoping to yeah. create. Like, and, mm. <laughs> and how do I prioritise time? And I wouldn't be able to, that my child would always have my time. Do you think, do you think with women that are now um, massive entrepreneurs mm -hmm. or they want to head that way, but they also want to, you know, I don't want to say the old school woman, but they want to have that family. Do you think one is going to suffer, either your business or your children and your family? I think it depends on the type of business you're running. So when you're founding and the, the business is like startup in the early stages, mm. it's draining. Like you, you can't run away from it, so you've got to be all involved. Mm. Yeah. I think when a business is established and it's in different places and you've got a really massive support, I didn't have a massive support team around me. So I was doing a lot of the work. And I think when you're in that phase of business, yeah. it's difficult to say truly, oh, I'm going to be home at a certain yeah. time and have dinner. Yeah. Have you poured start in a family because you've been so invested in business and you've been so successful where you haven't had the opportunity to, you know, make, have a husband and children? I think it's not like I paused it. I think subconsciously I knew it was on the right time. Yeah. And I felt that if I did, it'd be really difficult at that point and in the last sort of seven years to really balance family life mm. and grow in this business and really mm. giving it the opportunities. Do I regret that choice? No, absolutely yeah. don't. Mm. But did I step away at the right time? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. What's next? Because we, we're coming towards the end of our time. Pick me in it, family. Well, well, I've got another business. I don't, I'm not... Yeah, I mean, I'm she, 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 she want more money. She don't. No, I've really, I've, I had another business as well. So my first ever business called Let's Play Netball still exists. Still exists, you said that. And yeah. it's still growing. So that takes up some of my time. I think I'm in a really privileged position where I can take, make really good choices about what I do next yeah, and course. how I spend my time. So what does that look like? Well, there's a lot of things on the table and I haven't quite decided if I'm being honest. Mm. I think due to lockdown, I've had an opportunity to really stop and assess what makes me happy mm. and the things that really drive me and what I would like my everyday week to look like. Mm. And I've got a couple of things that are floating around. I so we can expect well, you the, popping up maybe. on our TV screens? I or? don't know about TV screens, but we'll see. We'll I, see. I, I, I think I've got a great story to tell. I think I've got great experiences that I could definitely translate to another business, mm. opportunities. Mm. But I also think right now my focus is just me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Natalie yeah. And that's the individual. Taking time out for yourself to enjoy the fruits, the fruits of your labour. Sometimes you get so consumed, it's yeah. like... When, chasing, when's... chasing the bag. Yeah, chasing, yeah. chasing the bag. The bag. Yeah. I've heard that before, Lynn. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Listen, Natalie, it's been an absolute pleasure to have the conversation with you today. Thanks so much for your time. And will you come back and tell us when you've made the decision about what you're doing next and you've got that bag that Lynn keeps running after you? Yeah? Absolutely, yeah. Thank you so much <laughs> for having me, guys. Wicked. Thank absolute you. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure.